Washing my hair to Mrs. Batten of Corsham. Under the shower this spring morning, I'm suddenly aware it's more than half a century since I bowed my head over Mrs. Batten's crackle glazed sink and squinted through the wet brown tangle of my hair. It's like my daughter's come back, she said. In Mrs. Batten's cottage, the steamy kitchen air breathed last night's dumpling stew. The flowered cushion of her pinafore leaned over me as she worked the silver crin in and rubbed my head with fingers that had cleaned and scrubbed so many children, floors and dishes. Today, as I stare through thin white hair in my own shower, I know she is under a pitted slab in a village graveyard. I'll never find it, for I never learned her Christian name. I want to thank her for her care. Mrs. Batten was not just a landlady, but a mother when I most needed one. <laughs> this is called Let Death Be Irish. I see death, she whispers, like a retirement plan. Living was such hard work. She talks as if death itself was standing by her bed. The grapes and the fruit? No, I never eat them. I just sketch them. Sunlight slithers across the hospital floor, sneaks under her bed. My reflection escapes the mirror. Nothing but nothing there. As for my shadow, it comes and goes, a slave of the sun. Only my ghost sits on my bed, chats to me about how things are to be. I hope death is Irish and says, ah, how are you, pet? Are you coming or what? <laughs> she I used to look after her and when I came to call for her to take her for a walk in the park or her garden, I used to say, are you coming or what, pet? Like that. So uh, when she was in the hospital and she could no longer move or anything like that, and I couldn't bring her to the park, I used to put her hand through mine and I said, come on for a walk <laughs> and you can walk in my voice. <laughs> and I'd tell her everything that could be seen and she, she loved that. So whenever uh, I came into the hospital, she always used to then reverse it to me and said, are you coming or what, love? And I'd take her on a flight of fancy and describe everything. And she said, I love walking in the footsteps of your voice. So there you go. This is just a little poem called Wandering. Um, it's from our visit to Ireland, to Dublin, and the, no, it was, it was Cork, Cork. It was in Cork, Crawford the Cork gallery. Art Gallery. And uh, I did some drawing in the gallery, and I drew this uh, headless, armless, legless torso <laughs> of a man. It was a beautiful statue. It was very strong, even though it had no appendages at all. Wondering, drawing a copy of a copy of a copy of the Belvedere Torso by Apollonius in the Crawford Art Gallery, Cork City. I speculate on the day of the man who modelled for Apollonius when he made the original torso. Did he turn up for the job after a breakfast of goat steaks and grapes with all the pips in? or honey, honeycomb and yoghurt? Did he complete press-ups in an exercise regime? Or simply report to the studio after ploughing or stacking grain stooks or hauling fishnet nets from the wine-dark sea? And were his hands large and hard and brown and soft and kindly when he stroked his wife's hair and held his children? Yes, this... <laughs> This is a poem called The Song of the Side. Sides always fascinated me because they looked like pterodactyls hung up on the wall. And this lived in the, the stable with Dolly the horse. And I read this poem in Pig... what? Pig Hog Press. Pig Hog Press down in Brighton. And I was waiting to go on, and I was waiting to go on. I put my poems down on the table and I had a nightlight there. And my poems caught flame. And the barman had to come down and put me out with a towel. <laughs> and there was just enough of the poem left 
to be able to make it up. <laughs> My fond memories of that. The Song of the Side. My uncle sits cross-legged, the shiny sickle of the sight held in his hands, as if he had pulled down a moon, wrestled it to the ground, tamed it. He looks like a friendly death having a tea break. Nothing dies in these seconds. The world holds its breath. The side winces with light, so sharp it can cut, uh, can cut through thought. It cuts through what I am thinking now. The whetstone sings to the curve of the metal. It cuts through time, sharper, sharper each time. My mind bleeds. It cuts through each successive second, uh, so that each second is separate from the rest. The song the whetstone sings to the side scares me. My uncle takes a horsehair from Dolly's tail, so softly she thinks it's still there. The sight eagerly divides it into two. Dolly whinnies, nuzzles him affectionately. He runs his thumb along the blade. Blood sings in the open air. He sucks it. Perfect, he smiles. Perfect. The world catches its breath.